Um, you've seen some fantastic slides today, and I'm just going to show you this one, and that's going to be the basis of my, of my, my whole talk. So I'll give you this back, because I have a habit of doing things like put, putting these things in my pocket and walking off with them. Um, I th I'm obsessed with this picture. Some of you will know exactly what it is. Um, others of you may be a bit mystified. But to me, this is the picture of the 21st century. It marks the lowest point in European history. It's part of a slide that began with the terrible miscalculations that led to the First World War, which was going to be the war to end all wars. Um, the botched way in which the First World War ended with the Treaty of Versailles and all the injustices and mistakes that were made then, the economic troubles of the 20s and the, and the great crash of 1929, um, the rise to power of Hitler in Germany. And then it ends up here. It ends up here with a Nazi and a Soviet officer shaking hands over the dismembered corpse of Poland. Now, they're in uniforms, and you know, you may, those of you who are good at uniforms will notice whether uh, NKVD, Gestapo, regular army in the background. But actually, they're bandits. They've stolen another country. Um, the regimes, they represent a thieves as well. They've stolen the destiny of the Russian people and of the German people. And it's not just the terrible events that this picture signifies, because after that, we then get the Holocaust. It was the pact between Hitler and Stalin which let the Nazi killing machine loose onto the part of Europe where more Jews lived than anywhere else. If it hadn't been for this kind of, for, for the deal that led to that meeting, the Nazi-Soviet pact, um, we wouldn't have had, um, we wouldn't have had the Holocaust. We wouldn't have had the, at the end of the war, we wouldn't have had the com communist captivity of half of Europe, which went on until 1989. It's not just those events, it's the ideas that that, me that meeting stands for. The idea that might is right, that the big countries do the deals that they can, the small countries make the best of it, or in Poland's case, there wasn't really the best, they just make of it whatever they can, grit their teeth and try and survive. Now, I have to be very careful here as a Brit. It's very easy for the Brits. We have the same narrative about the Second World War that many Russians have, that this is a good war, and it was our moment of great glory. We were on the right side, we toughed it out, and we liberated Europe, and everyone should be jolly grateful to us. And, of course, that's as phony for a Brit to think that as it is for a Russian to think that about what they call the Great Patriotic War. We have a lot to be ashamed of as well in Britain. We didn't have the Nazi-Soviet pact, but we dismembered Czechoslovakia um, in our deal with Hitler in Munich. And without that, um, maybe we would, wouldn't have had the Second World War either. So it's easy to look at this picture and just feel nothing but gloom and shame and sorrow and anger and wonder how it ever was that we came to such a ghastly moment such as this, the two worst totalitarian regimes the world had ever seen at that stage, because, of course, we hadn't yet learned that things could get even worse, as they did under Mao Zedong in China, um, greeting each other joyfully, respectfully, collaborating over the ruin of the European security order. But in a way, you can also say, well, this is a low point. It got better ever since then. You know, Poland regained its statehood. Several decades later, Poland regained its freedom. Poland is now in the European Union, it's in NATO. And actually, Poland has never in its history been as safe, as strong, as free, and as prosperous as it is today. So in the end, these guys lost, despite the terrible things they did and the terrible things they stood for, and Poland won. We're here. We're here in the very sad environment of seeing the, in, the, in the Jewish Museum, seeing all the terrible destruction that this, 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 that this, this event and the thinking behind it led to. But as Jonathan's just explained, this is now one of the best places in the world to be Jewish. So we're back and we won. But that doesn't take away from the fact that a great crime was committed. And great crimes, you may be wondering when I'm going to get onto apologies here, because that's what I'm talking about, great crimes deserve apologies. We feel in our Judeo-Christian culture that you can't forgive someone unless they repent. There has to be some sort of restitution. And I think apologies make a lot of sense when they're delivered by an individual. So if I say to you, Ja przepraszam serdecznie za masakrowanie języka polskiego i języka Mickiewicza, you understand 
I guess most of you understand, that I'm apologizing because I don't speak Polish as well as my brother does. Um, and that makes sense. You can have an apology on a trivial level, you can have an apology on a serious level. I'm very sorry for some of the things I did to you when we were little, by the way. We can talk about that later. Um, but we can, we, we, we can make... We can make we, apology makes complete sense as, as, as an individual. Apology makes sense also on a symbolic and representative level. It really meant something when Willy Brandt went to Warsaw and dropped his knees in Warsaw at the memorial to the ghetto uprising. That was a really big deal. Germany paid up after the war. Many people would say they didn't pay enough. The Greeks, for example, still feel that there's huge outstanding debts. And you can argue about that, but no one can say the Germans did nothing. The Germans have made, um, have, have, and you see this, I would argue very strongly, in the way in which they pushed, more, perhaps more than any other country in Europe, for Poland to join the EU. The, Pol the Germans are aware of their historical responsibility. So that's the guys on this side. What about the guys on the other side? What about the Soviets? And that's where it gets more, gets more, more tricky. Russia would argue, and I've put this again and again to Russian officials, I was based in Russia for a long time, I was in the Soviet Union before that, and I'd say, why don't you guys say sorry to the countries that you occupied, to the former captive nations, for all the terrible things that happened in the, in the Soviet Empire, because it would be the basis for a much better relationship. And the res Russian response to that is, we've already apologized. Back in 1988, the Supreme Soviet, or the Congress of People's Deputies, I forget which it was, they renounced the molotov rimtrop pact. It's over, it's done. And Putin was asked this at a press conference by a very brilliant Estonian journalist called Astrid, who said, why don't you apologize to Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania for what you've done? Putin said, the matter's closed, we've done it. And that's one of the problems with trying this idea of using apologies as a currency. One side may think they've done enough, the other side thinks you haven't done nearly, done, done nearly enough. Now, you might argue, why are we talking about all this ancient history now? This was 75 years ago. Why are we worrying about this business of unburied history, of apologies that were either never made or weren't made enough um, in the current context of 2015? And the answer is that this unburied history is at the root of the European security crisis that we are experiencing at the moment. This is the worst time in European security that has happened in my lifetime. I was born in 1962. It's probably worse than the Hung that we had during the Hungarian uprising. It's as dangerous, maybe, as the Berlin airlift. It's a really deep and serious time where Russia and the West are seeing European security in completely different ways. Russia thinks the rules are unfair. It doesn't see why it should have to obey them. It thinks it's entirely justified, what, uh, it's entirely justified in what it did. We think that Russia's behavior is outrageous, and we're stumbling and fumbling towards a way of trying to defend ourselves and to constrain Russia. And the basis of all that is history. Because if you look at it from a Russian point of view, and I don't endorse the way they look at it, but this is the story that Putin tells the Russian people, and to a large extent it's believed, Russia is owed an apology. The Soviet Union, great Soviet Union, that destroyed fascism, liberated half of Europe, remember this is what he thinks, not what I think, was brought low by the West with a clever mixture of low oil prices and high arms spending and collapse, what Putin himself calls the geopolitical catastrophe of the last century. And then, far from being grateful to the Russian people for having overthrown communism, for pulling their troops out of Eastern Europe, no, the West then pressed home its advantage. It brought all these um, countries into NATO. It forced an economic model on Russia that didn't work. And then all through, after 9-11, when Russia offered help to the West on anti-terrorism, um, instead of that, the West pressed ahead, encircling Russia with NATO expansion, cheating Russia, misleading Russia, trying to undermine Russia, trying for regime change in Russia. So if anyone's going to apologize, it should be the West. Now, that is something which many Russians sincerely believe. So let's just imagine what would an apology from, take a big Western country, a big Western country which spends a lot of money on defense, which is a core member of the most important bits of the West, a country like Poland, for example. What would a Polish apology to Russia look like? And this is where you can see how tricky this gets. Well, you'd f first of all, you'd have to say, we're really, really grateful for the way you liberated us, and we quite understand that you couldn't do anything during the Warsaw Uprising because your troops are very tired, so they had to wait 
on the Vistula while the, while the Nazis did it. So no hard feelings about the Warsaw Uprising. We understand. We're, we're grateful. Yeah, that, was, that was good. And we're very grateful for the economic and political system that you enforced because, well, it, it led to the industrialization of Poland. And yeah, we weren't very industrialized before the war. And thanks to you, we've got Nova Huta. So thanks for that as well. And we're sorry if we seemed, we seemed ungrateful. And um, yes, and we're very grateful for the way in which, uh, in which communism um, collapsed and the fact you pulled, you know, pulled your troops out. And we're very sorry that we, um, we didn't um, thank you at the time, and instead of which we joined NATO. That was really bad. We see it was very tactless. We should have been really quite, quite grateful to you, and that was, a, that was a big mistake, joining NATO, so we're sorry if, if that hurt your feelings. And actually, when we look round, we see that the, the country that's really got it right is Belarus. So basically, we would like to be like Belarus, because we realise that that would make you feel happy. So please accept our apology and help us follow down the Belarusian route. That would be the sort of apology that, um, that would make in the, the sort of Putinist Russians feel good. Well, of course, it ain't going to happen. Poland's not going to do that. Estonia's not going to do that. Latvia's not going to do that. Lithuania's not going to do that. None of the countries that are so getting on Russia's nerves would in a million years want to give that kind of apology because we remember this stuff. We remember this stuff, and we remember it with pain, we remember it with a degree of resentment and anger, and we remember it with a degree of bafflement because this picture doesn't seem to mean anything to the Russians. So what are we going to do? Well, we can't, I think we can't be imprisoned by our desire for apology. I thought Jonathan put it very well. It's very easy to dwell on your grievances. And grievances can be great things. Grievances can give you a burning sense of injustice, the desire to set the world to rights. They can make you very cautious about things you've got wrong. I'm never going to make that mistake again. I remember what happened to me when, when, when I did it. Um, so grievances can inspire. They can motivate. They're very important from that point of view. They have things you learn from. But they're also constraints. You can be imprisoned by your grievance. You can dwell on your grievance. You can sit there fulminating about why does nobody realize how much I suffered? Why is nobody going to come and apologize to me and put it right? Well, maybe one day they will. And when they do, that will be great. But in the meantime... As our previous speaker said, we have to get on. We have our life in front of us. And as I said before, Poland came out of this far better. We don't actually know who these guys are. I guess they're dead. Um, as we heard earlier, it's surviving Nazi war criminals, sadly not Russian war criminals, but sadly not Nazi war criminals, still get prosecuted. We won the historical argument, and we're back. So I hope the day will come when Russia will be able to say a heartfelt sorry, a German-style sorry, start some restitution, maybe start giving back the sort of, um, some of the property that was looted during the Soviet occupation from the captive nations. I think maybe if my great and sadly late friend, Boris Nemtsov, had ever become Russian president, he would have been the first to apologize. He would have been so pleased to come to Tallinn and Riga and Vilnius and Prague and Warsaw and these other capitals and say, please accept us as friends now. We are your neighbors. We have so much in common. We want to be friends. We're really sorry for what we did. We want to be as friendly with you as you are now with Germany. And I do hope that day is going to come. But in the meantime, we have to get on and live our lives. But one thing we cannot be pushed into, and this is where I'm going to finish, one thing, one thing we cannot be pushed into is to apologizing for doing the things that keep us free and safe. And this is one of the things that most worries me at the moment. I spend a lot of time working on Russian information warfare, as we now call it. It used to be propaganda or just agitprop. And Russia's been amazingly successful in getting across the idea that this European security crisis we're now facing is the West's fault. Because we're incredibly fair-minded in the West. We always think there must be two sides to every story. And if one side is cross, well, that must mean the other side did something wrong. And so we see this absurd business of people blaming the Ukrainians for wanting to be Europeans. The Ukrainians who are the only people who've died in the cause of European Union expansion. They died in blood-soaked European flags on the streets of Kiev, being shot at by their riot police. And then we say to the Ukrainians, well, you know, you did push it a bit. You know, all that you know, deep and comprehensive free trade agreement, that was a bit rash, really. You, know, you shouldn't have been so enthusiastic. We shouldn't have really offered it. So you know, we're sorry. We put, better tell the Russians we're, we're a bit sorry we pushed it too hard in, uh, in, in Ukraine in these countries. 
And then maybe if we say a nice sorry to the Russians, then maybe they'll leave Ukraine alone and we can get back to all things that bother us. We're supposed to feel sorry for NATO expansion. The greatest thing that NATO did was to bring in the former captive nations. Can you imagine how dangerous Europe would be now if we hadn't expanded NATO, if we hadn't brought Poland and Hungary and the Czech Republic in 98, and if particularly if we hadn't brought the Baltic states um, and the other, uh, the other new member states in, in 2004. We'd have a giant series of Moldovas, one after the other, all down Europe's eastern border. Are we supposed to apologize for that? Are we supposed to succumb to this Russian narrative where the Russians say, you've really offended us? This is like a guy who lives in a house who says to his neighbors, please don't put a burglar alarm on your house because it makes me feel nervous. And you're supposed to apologize. I'm so sorry about the burglar alarm. Yes, I realize that implies that you're a bad neighbor, so I'll, I'll take the burglar down, 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 alarm down right now. And, uh, and please, please don't be offended. So let's hope for apologies. In our culture, it's absolutely right. Wrongs can be righted only really when the people who've perpetrated the wrongs or their representatives try and make restitution. I would actually love it if the Germans, who, as I say, have already done a lot, I would love it if the Germans would take the lead in whenever we see this revolting phrase of Polish death camp. I have a Google, an all-languages, real-time Google alert for Polish death camp. It pops up and buzzes on my phone, and I immediately tweet it, and I get people to try and write into whatever little newspaper it is, wherever in the world, that has used this phrase. But I think it would be just great if the Germans would say, by the way, please don't call them Polish death camps, they were our death camps. That would be really good. There's a lot more that people can do to make apologies real. But do not get suckered. Do not get bullied. Do not get persuaded into apologizing for the things that we've got right. Thanks very much.